Hi y'all, it's me, the Jaguar, and welcome back to Ridiculous Confessions of a Successful Looking Artist. That would be me. Today's topic, Alicia Force's fleet and finding opportunities in egregious errors. A reader asked me recently how I came up with the idea of the warring cultures in the Pelted versus Fleet novels, which was extremely flattering because it implied that I consciously decided, hey, it would be cool if a non-militaristic organization with lots of armed ships started having issues that could only be resolved by a real military structure. Alas, that's not how that happened, though I'm going to pause a moment to fantasize about how cool that would have made me sound. Okay, done now. On to the gory truth, which is somehow even more embarrassing than my revelation about how the Eldritch were spawned by my teenage love of Elric. This story goes even further back to the birth of the Peltedverse, which was Teen Me's attempt to take what was cool in Star Trek and add cat girls to it. Hmm, am I mortified yet? Let me keep going. When I say Teen Me, I can almost say Tween Me, because the earliest known Peltedverse character was Alicia Forrest, and she first showed up when I was 14. 14 year old Jaguar thought Star Trek was the best thing ever, full of adventures, aliens, and a hopeful future. She wanted some of that magic for herself, so she set about building herself a universe where her cat people could roam the universe doing cool stuff. Young Jaguar, though, had literally no conception of how a military worked. And if you go back and rewatch the original Star Trek, you'll discover that's no way to learn either, because as far as the writers of the original series were concerned, the ship was composed solely of the bridge crew, all officers, a handful of disposable security goons, and a yeoman who brought Kirk coffee, and whom I assumed to be a secretary, because she was a girl in a short skirt who brought Kirk coffee. But hey, young me could work with that. So she cheerfully created the Pelted versus Fleet, which had all of six ranks and somehow functioned, and went to town. Fast forward several years. Teen me was now young college me, and several years of devouring military science fiction had acquainted her with the billion horrendous errors she'd made in designing Fleet. Further research made it clear that I'd had no earthly idea what I was doing, and that my military was going to look to everyone with a clue like something created by a 14-year-old who'd learned about the Navy from Star Trek, which was fair, because that's exactly what it was. But Teen Me did not want anyone to realize that because horrors. I was in agony. I had all this backstory and character development and all of it was fatally flawed. The thought that people might read it and discover the depths of my ignorance was excruciating. The sensible thing to do would have been to trash it all or to overhaul it completely. And yet, that's exactly what I didn't do. With all the innate stubbornness of a proud kid who's been backed into a corner, I doubled down on my error and said, you know what? I meant to do that. At which point, I threw myself into it by asking, okay, but what does that break down to? And the obvious answer was, I didn't make that mistake. The Pelted did, in universe. Why not? They were a bunch of lab animals who escaped Earth. They didn't know any military personnel. The closest thing they ever met up with were the security guards they glimpsed at the compound, where they were created and held. And maybe one or two of them saw some of the same ridiculously incomplete or naive media I did and made assumptions. Or maybe they read real histories and said, we're not going to do that ourselves because we're not going to need it, being better than humans and all that. Well, maybe it was some mishmash of things, but it's completely reasonable for them to realize they needed some kind of security force have some vague guidelines on it, and try to build on that. That gave college me the excuse she needed to keep writing Fleet the way she developed it. That didn't fix her nagging sense of unease, that she'd still be seen as an ignoramus, though. And that unease stuck around until post-college me, rereading Alicia's Fall, saw what college me had missed, that there were humans in Fleet, which is when I thought to ask what they thought of the Pelted's version of a military. Post-college me, knowing the Shotkoven War was coming, had a light bulb moment. Look, there's the theme for this set of pelted verse novels. They're about the culture clash between humanity and actual military culture, and the pelted and their desire to hold on to their values and their culture, and the external pressures that might influence those changes. This is the real reason that I now consider Alicia's Fall a prequel, because while it sets the stage for the novels in the series, it doesn't grapple with the theme that animates them. 
And while I still consider these novels to be my homage to Star Trek, they're much more about cultural change than the adventures that originally inspired Tween Jaguar. And all of this brings me to an observation about mistakes. See, we all know that as artists, we have ideas and themes that matter to us. We have favorite character archetypes and favorite plot dressing, and even favorite turns of phrase. If you only write one or two books in your lifetime, no one's going to call you on it if you revisit those favorites. Even five or six novels are fine, but if you keep going, you run the risk of repeating yourself. Now, a little repetition is fine. Readers come to your work for your themes, after all. You don't pick up a Stephen King novel if what you want is a J.K. Rowling experience. But if you're not careful, your 20th book is going to sound a lot like your 30th, and by book 50, what you're going to end up with is Xanth. And I say this only because even Piers Anthony is sick of Xanth. If you want to prevent that, you have to actively seek out experiences and inspirations, new grist for your mill. But even that process can be fraught, because unless you're careful, what you'll end up gravitating toward is more of the stuff that already interests you. What's delightful about mistakes, then, is that they inject the unexpected and unwanted into your perfectly ordered universe. If I had gone back and retconned Alicia's fleet into something more recognizable as a real navy, the Start Answer books would be perfectly at home on the shelf, next to all the other military science fiction stories that taught me just how badly I'd messed up. But because I decided to work with that error, I created something I wouldn't have come up with on my own no matter how hard I'd tried. Are the resulting books better because of it? I don't know. But they're certainly not what I planned, and I think there's value there. Long story short, improvising around your mistakes can keep your work fresher than if you'd tried to hide them. And really, the hiding rarely works very well. So isn't it fantastic that there's a better way to address them? This is the Jaguar, signing off. Thanks for listening.